worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has some great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the light. Oh, Jesus, I say. Yes and amen, you will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus i say your name lifted high oh god you have done great
just now we're going to enter into a time of prayer. So just pray as you feel led, whether it be to pray for yourself or for others, maybe those who are struggling or those who are maybe unwell at the minute, or even if it's just a prayer, prayer of thanks to God for all the amazing things he's doing in your life. Let's just come before God who hears us, who cares for us and who answers us. soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Through death to life everlasting He passed and we follow Him there Over us and no more have dominion For more than conquerors we are Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Let 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. All the day long This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long Well, good morning. Week four of four of paternity and annual leave and I just couldn't help myself. I wanted to jump on and do a couple of things very quickly. The first one is this. I want to just celebrate the women in our church. We are so thankful for each and every one of you. And as today is Mother's Day, we want to celebrate every single one of you, either as an earthly mother or as a spiritual mother. We are people who are called to make disciples. And I know that so many of you walk hand in hand with different individuals in the church, pointing them to Jesus, either through your example or through your instruction. So we praise God and we thank God for your influence, each and every one of you, on our lives. And we hope that you enjoy being celebrated this Mother's Day. The second thing I want to do is I want to introduce to you our speaker for today. Our speaker today is Lucy Allen and she is the youth and community worker at our church in Millbrook just outside of Lorne. Lucy is an excellent Bible teacher and I'm really excited to hear what God has laid on her heart to share with us as his people today. So let's just pray for Lucy but also pray for ourselves that we would have receptive hearts to hear what the word of the Lord says. Let's pray together. Lord we love you. And once again, we thank you that we are found in your house. Lord, that we are the temple of the Lord. That even though we are gathered in our own homes, Lord, we are still gathered together as the people of God through this wonderful, wonderful technology. Lord, we pray now that as we come and we gather around your word, Lord, that we would have ears to hear what it is that you're saying to us, that any distractions that we have would be put to one side and that we would well and truly press in to you. We pray for Lucy, your servant, as she comes and delivers the word which you have laid upon her heart and her mind to share with us today. Lord, may she be blessed as she is a blessing to us and may your word go forth in power and authority this morning. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Morning church and hello there. <laughs> My name is Lucy and I am the youth and community worker at Millbrook Church of the Nazarene and it's such a pleasure to be with you guys this morning. Albeit it is over a screen, I really do look forward to the day where we can join together again and I get to meet some of you lovely people in person. 
but this morning it is such a privilege for me to come and to share with you guys and to learn from the word of God together. In Millbrook over the past number of months we have been going through and working through the books of the gospel. We've been working through them chapter by chapter, learning about Jesus, learning about his ministry and his works and his miracles and his preaching and all that he was and all that he did on this earth. And it's been so, so encouraging for us. So I would really love to share some of that with you guys today as well. I know that our pastor Ruth had preached from um, the book of Luke as well. So that's where I'm going to be sharing from today as well. Today, I would love it if you would join me as we read from Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. One day, he and his disciples got into a boat, and he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they were sailing, he fell asleep. Then a fierce windstorm came down on the lake. They were being swamped, and they were in danger. He came and woke them up, saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. So they ceased and there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, asking one another, another, who then is this? He commands even the winds and the waves and they obey him. Let's pray together this morning. God, we thank you that you are good that you're mighty, that you're sovereign, and that you hold us in the palm of your hand. We thank you this morning for the opportunity to be together as your church. I pray that you would unite us around your word, that you would teach us more about you today. I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that you would speak to me. I pray that you would use me and that it would be your words this morning and not my own. We thank you that you're the same yesterday, today and forever. We thank you that you love us completely. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in this chapter of Luke, we are right in the midst of Jesus' active ministry. He is well and truly on the move. It is thought that this is his second tour of Galilee and he is moving from place to place. He's preaching the good news, he's teaching his followers, he's performing many miracles and he's impacting the lives of so many people along the way. And as he was travelling, Luke says that the 12 disciples were with him, along with a certain group of women who had been healed from evil spirits and sickness. Now, not every woman in this group is mentioned um, directly in Luke's narrative, but the three that he does specifically talk about are Mary of Magdalene, Joanna and Susanna. We know that Mary had been healed by Jesus. It says that seven demons had come out of her. And because of this, at this time, she wasn't really held as somebody of very high class or importance. A lot of the times it has actually been suggested that she might have even been a prostitute. We don't know if that is true or not, but what we do know is that because she suffered in this way, because she was possessed for such a long period of time, there was a particular image that surrounded her and all that she was. At that time, Mary would have been discriminated against and judged and talked about and pushed off to the side as evil and infected and lost. And then we have Joanna, who is said here to be Herod's steward. So this word steward in Greek is actually translated to epitropos. Please excuse my pronunciation, my Greek is not my strong suit. But basically this means that this person looked after all of the king's financial interests. Joanna was important. She was an official and she was held very highly in society's eyes. We don't know very much about Susanna or about the other women in this particular group who were following and supporting Jesus. But the ones that we do read of, we know that they were quite a mixed bunch, much like the disciples were. A lot of biblical scholars, including William Barclay especially, they find it really interesting um, that these two women were specifically grouped together in this way. 
Mary, who had such a dark, dark past, and Joanna, who was an official and an incredibly important woman, woman, were on this journey together. They were following the same master. They were working with each other for the greater good. And to me, that's quite a beautiful picture of the Bride of Christ. Even in our own churches, I'm sure that you can see that we are an incredibly diverse range of people, which is amazing. And as we go out further into our country, into national church, into the global church, everywhere that the church is on this earth, there is so much more in it than we could ever imagine. And God's designed it to be that way. He has designed it to be different and to be beautiful and to be connected. I don't know about you, but I am friends with and connected with people who I would have never even met if it hadn't been for this crazy thing that we call church. And I love that there's different perspectives, that we teach one another, we help each other grow, that there is intergenerational bonding, that we look out for each other, that we help each other. How we form this bond around the only thing in life that is certain. Our differences don't worry us. It doesn't matter. It's not relevant. That's not what we focus on. What we focus on and what we bond over is our God, our master, our father. We have a loyalty to him and that makes us part of a much bigger, beautiful picture. And our father is a good, good father. And I love the fact that he made us so different. That's something that we learn about in Sunday school and in primary school and when we are very young that I am special because God made me and that is so true but do you really believe that? Do you really understand the significance of that? That you were thought of and created and developed and knit together and placed on this earth by a heavenly father who loves you? Our individuality, who we are, who you are, is an expression of God. He is within you because he made you himself. He is the creator of all things and he made you in his image. He made the sun and he made the moon and he made the stars and the sea and the land and the fish and the birds and the animals and he made those beautiful sunset pictures that we all upload to Instagram and he made those beautiful mountaintop views that we all climb Cave Hill to see. I definitely don't but you can send me a picture of those ones. But he made it all. He made everything on this earth and he made you too. You are a living, beautiful, spectacular creation of the king above all kings. And when we invite, when he invites us into his kingdom, just as he did with these women, he guides us. He wants us to learn and to grow and to follow his perfect example. But he loves us completely. God doesn't want us to lose our personalities or our qualities or forget who we were up until this point. But he loves who we are. He made who you are. And he includes us in his will on this earth. It says in verse 3 that these women were supporting him from their possessions. Now, if Jesus was who he says he was and we believe him to be the son of God, do you really believe that he needed these women and their money to do the incredible things that he was doing? I kind of imagine maybe a bit of a cartoon or a caricature of what Jesus could have been like at this time and I almost imagine it just like those cringy Disney Channel TV shows that we watch with the wizards and these magic people who snap their fingers and suddenly the impossible appears. They can snap their fingers and suddenly they have enough money to buy that sandwich that they wanted or they snap their fingers and um, their room is completely tidy or they snap their fingers and suddenly their bus goes 10 times faster and they're not late for school anymore. I don't even think that Jesus would have needed to clap or to snap his fingers. He didn't need to do that. If he needed something here on this earth, he could have just made it appear. But Jesus is humble. He allowed himself to depend on others. He allowed himself to receive from others. He allowed others to be a part of what he is doing. 
what a privilege it is for all of us to be a part of what he's doing. For him to include us and make us important and make our lives significant and give us a pace in his great masterpiece. These women provided for Jesus from what they had. They didn't need to get an extra job or go and beg for money or go and find money from these other people. They gave what they had. And Jesus used and multiplied and did the most incredible things from what they could give him. This morning, I hope you remember that what you have is enough. What you have is more than enough for God to work with. Yes, right now we are restricted, but our God is resourceful. He fed 5,000 people from a schoolboy's lunch. He made Adam, he created humanity from dust and he makes beauty from ashes. God doesn't expect us to bring transformation or amazement or wonder. Only he can do that. That's his job. But we can give him what we have. We can allow his presence into our lives and give him permission to use it for his glory. It's our job to follow him and it's his job to create the amazing. Through this journey that Jesus is now continuing throughout this chapter in Luke, he preaches for a little while, he teaches the crowds, he talks about some parables and then it says that him and his disciples hop on a boat, which is what we read this morning. They were travelling to Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee and what we know now from obviously reading what we have, that there was a demon possessed man in this town that Jesus was going to heal. So at the outset, before they set off on this journey, Jesus says, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. And off they went. So once they're on this boat and once they set sail, Jesus falls asleep and suddenly a huge storm appeared. They were in danger. The disciples were absolutely terrified. And anytime we read this story, I think that it's important to remember that these men weren't just a little bit seasick. Many of them were experienced fishermen who had probably been in this situation before. They've probably seen a few storms in their lifetime. They might have even seen how these storms have injured or even killed people that they worked with or people that they were friends with. They wouldn't have been scared by a little bit of rocking. This was serious and they were terrified. So they rushed to Jesus and they wake him up. Jesus must be quite a heavy sleeper, much like myself. <laughs> but they wake him and they shout and they scream and they panic and they say, Master, Master, we're going to die. We are going to die. And I'd never quite thought of this before, that they actually say we. They include Jesus in this disaster. But they, they know that he's the son of God, so surely a storm can't kill him. He's divine, he's not even human, he is God, so surely he'll survive it. Maybe God will send out a cloud and he'll float away with it. I don't know what they thought. But the disciples are in agony over this situation. And maybe, maybe they don't think that Jesus is going to die. Maybe they do think that God will save him and he'll be alright. But when they say we, they think it's all over for them. They think that what they have built together with this man Jesus is all over. This journey, this ministry, all the followers that Jesus had accumulated, all the people that he had impacted, all the miracles that he had performed, all the things that they had witnessed, this incredible thing that these disciples had been a part of. If they die on this boat, it's all over. They aren't going to see the end of the story. The end result won't be fulfilled. They think that. They think that we're all going to die. How often are we over anxious about God's work? How often do we worry too much about what's going to happen and how God's going to move and how much impact this will make and where it's all going? As if that's actually up to us. As if he isn't the one in control. Over the last year, I've had so many conversations, obviously, about the pandemic and everything that's going on around us. And 
one of the most repeated phrases that I've said back and forward to people and people have said to me is that, yeah, we all seem to think we were in control, didn't we? Didn't we? We all seem to think we were. As if those plans that we used to make and those appointments we used to put in our diaries and those yearly calendars that were filled with events and worship nights and conferences and youth weekends, as if that actually made us in control of what God was doing. Yes, the pandemic has highlighted us that we aren't really in control, but as Christians we should know that already. That this is reality, and that's a good thing, we should thank God for that. Whether we are worried about our own situations and circumstances, or we're worried that we aren't doing enough, that we can't control the outcomes, that we can't make it better, we know that it isn't up to us. It never was. And we can't be stuck. Pandemic or no pandemic, this isn't over. It's far from over. Dr. George Morgan says this, the boat cannot go down because Jesus is on board. He's got us. It's gonna be okay. So when they wake Jesus, he immediately gets up and rebukes the wind and the waves and they ceased. This idea of speaking to the wind and waves is actually an old proverb for doing the impossible. Nobody can do Nobody can control the weather, nobody can do that. And yes, in Northern Ireland, some of you may wake up just like me and sing the wee song, rain, rain, go to Spain, never show your face again. But it hasn't worked for me so far. If it has for you, you can let me know. But Jesus is doing exactly that. He is doing the impossible right before their eyes. And once he deals with the storm and he makes it all go calm, he turns to the disciples and he says, where is your faith? He doesn't turn around and say, why on earth are you so scared? Would you grow up already? Like, come on, why are you so worried? What what are you panicked for? I think that Jesus was well aware of how petrified they were by what had happened. Jesus isn't questioning the difficult circumstances, but he's questioning their unbelief in his promise. Jesus said, let's go to the other side of the lake. And he meant it. His word is true. He made a promise and they didn't believe that. They didn't believe that they were going to get to the other side of this lake. But Jesus said it. Jesus promised it and he was going to keep it. One of the most encouraging things that we can do is remember the promises of God. The promises that he gives us in his word. Promises that still apply, that are spoken over us, that are declared to us. And promises that we can still trust. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing that will happen will change who Jesus is and or what he is able to do or what he has promised to us. Nothing can change that. Yes, this storm would have shook the disciples to their core. But they forgot who they were with. They forgot that his word is final. His decision means something. His promises are true and that he has the ultimate authority. And when he reminded them, they were fearful and they were amazed. This storm was obviously a really pivotal moment for the disciples. They were so shocked and they didn't know what to do either in that moment or after it. They were still fearful after Jesus calmed this storm. What what had just happened? What do we do? Who is he? And when I read this story, I start to think of how the storms, the metaphorical kind that we can apply to this story, how they impact our lives, how during them we feel stuck, we feel afraid and we feel alone. And when we're carried through them, when we move past something that has absorbed us for so long, we are more aware than ever that things are uncertain. Jesus has done some incredible things in my life and I'm sure that he's done incredible things in your life and in your church and I can't wait to hear so much about that. But I'm sure that, like me, all of us do carry a bit of a sense of, what now? Whether we are living through our storm in the moment or whether Jesus has carried us through it or whether Jesus has done the miraculous in our lives, As humans, it is natural for us to always wonder what's next. 
what do I do now? How do I deal with this? How do I show this? How do I keep going? How do I use this? What now? And I don't have God plan, God's plan for your life. I can't tell you what God has called you to, only he can do that. But what I do have, what I do know, is that the safest place to be, whether in the storm or before the storm or after the storm, the safest place to be is at the feet of Jesus. Through this chapter of Luke, we read of so many people that have went through some crazy things. They were all impacted and changed by Jesus. And each one of them teaches us that he is enough, that he's what we need, that he is the answer, that he has all the power and all the authority. There is a reason why when Jesus drives demons out of a man, afterwards he is found just sitting at the feet of Jesus. There is a reason why these women that Jesus encountered and changed and supported, there's a reason why they gave up everything and followed him and supported him. There's a reason why the disciples didn't decide to leave Jesus at the shore that day and say, I okay, I'm, I'm not getting on no more boats for you. Through these experiences, they came to know that Jesus was the real deal. They witnessed and experienced his goodness and they knew that he had the authority. Following him, trusting him, clinging to him, makes sense. It's not a bad thing that you can't do this alone. It's not weak to depend on him. We should rely on him. We should lean on him, we should cry to him, we should follow him, we should celebrate with him, we should journey with him, we should need him. That is reality. That's the natural order of things. He is the creator and he created us. And it makes sense to lean on him. It makes sense to give him control because he already has authority over our lives and he has authority over the wind and the waves and he is in charge. And it makes sense to lean on the one whose arms never get tired. It makes sense to cling to the one who will never let go. What now? Who really knows? <laughs> What's next for me and my life? I have no idea. What's next for yours? I'm pretty clueless as well. But what I do know is that as long as we're with him, as long as we sit at his feet, he's got us. We are safe with him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your power and authority and that you are sovereign in our lives. We thank you that you died for us, that you made us new and that you desire to be with us. God, help us to remember to sit at your feet. Help us to know that we are safe with you. We pray that we would never forget how much you have done for us and how much you have changed our lives. I pray that every person who is listening this morning would know of your love for them, would know how cherished they are to you and we thank you that you have made us your beautiful bride. Be with us in all that we do. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. time of desperation but all we know is doubt and fear there is only one foundation we believe broken generation when all is dark you help us see there is only one salvation we believe Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He 
Thank you.